Out there. Welcome to the No Shit Cast. I'm your host, Matt Frazier. He's back, ladies and gentlemen. And it's uh, been kind of my fault. I haven't had him on sooner, but it's been busy as shit. But Neil Thompson's joining me on the show today. We're going to talk about this photo that came out uh, from NASA, the first ever photo of a black hole. It's kind of how far back this goes for me and wanting to talk to Neil about this. But um, this, uh, these latest discoveries and some of the stuff that's been happening in, uh, uh, cosmology and science, especially as it relates to black holes, there's been a lot of new information that's come out lately. So I wanted to definitely get a chance to get Neil on the show here and talk about the implications of that and uh, electric universe field theory and, uh, uh, things of that nature. So Neil, thanks for joining me, man. I appreciate it. How you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. How are you? Oh, I'm living the dream, buddy. I'm getting to talk to you on a on a beautiful Saturday morning here, and we get to sit back and 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 talk about you know the implications of something that's probably way beyond my uh, uh, comprehension, but <laughs> it's fun nonetheless. Oh, probably not. <laughs> so I, I, the way I set that up, right, is is uh, uh, that's when as soon as this stuff started coming out, um, I wanted to talk to well both you and and uh, Shifu Kariaga, Kariaga, but. Um, but I hadn't had a chance to catch up with you yet on this, and I and I kind of want to just feel you out and see, you know, what the what do you see the implications of this photo and the and some of the new data and the new science that's come out about uh, black holes lately, and how does that impact sort of, uh, you know, the electric universe stuff that you do? Well, uh, it's exactly what was expected. Um, now. The thing is, when you're looking at the photo, uh, you got to realize it's not really a photo. Uh, it's a conglomeration of data from 70 or so radio telescopes. The issue, of course, being that only radio waves can pierce that dark, um, that dark embryo or dark cloud that surrounds the core of galaxies. Um, so it's we, it's an amalgamation of stuff that's outside the visible spectrum that they have filtered somehow to put mm-hmm. into the visible spectrum so that you can actually see it on an image, right? Or give it color kind well, of thing. Yeah, we, we shouldn't cut. Now, as much as that might sound like magic, let's let's remember that night vision goggles and cell phones do that as well as listening to turning radio waves into sound. So yep. it's not yep. that it's not like it's that hard, but. What they did in, in this way is they uh, made the entire Earth a radio telescope. And uh, normally you can't do this sort of thing. Uh, this is a something that would be uh, impossible. So uh, kudos to them for being able to do that, like just storing the data and then organizing it in such a way that it comes out. Now – one of the things that was very interesting that 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 uh and i don't want to say girl the female doctor who was uh became quite famous for her photos it was like and katie, her, katie bowman or something like that i think was her something name, along right? those yeah. lines i yes um and so she deserves credit uh f- as much as every other person on that as much as they've all said However, uh, putting all those things together uh, was her job, and she did a quite good job. She coordinated that, and it was obviously a big task. But she mentioned in one quote that we have to be careful because we, if we tweak the data sets or algorithms too much, we end up inserting our own biases or some words to that effect into our image. And that, in a nutshell, is the problem that they have. Um, they they don't understand that they've 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 made an error. Uh, they falsified something, and uh, they don't under like some people do. I think she, that might have even been a hint. That could have been like a little, you know, a little kick from something uh, for her to say that. Um, 
Well, it's an indication I mean, then that, that that it's some of what you're seeing is derivative of their own individual bias based on what they think they already understand, right? And you already know what they think they see. Okay. So You've the, seen Interstellar, so you know what they think they should see, and uh, so they see that. Uh, but it, but to be fair, I think that they would see a ring. Um, that would be expected. Um, but to see this, um, their theory is that this is gravity based. That's their theory, and uh, they're sticking to it. Uh, yeah, that unfortunately, is. Unfortunately, that's their assumption, and that's the bias that they are writing into it. And they have only one force to do that with uh, well of course and then things crashing into each other how do you validate that out then you don't like i mean it's it was it's been fought every step of the way every time it's done something i mean if you learn the history of it uh the history of it is actually incredibly interesting um you have back in 1919 uh Sir Arthur Eddington decided, well, he didn't decide, but someone decided with or for him to uh, go and test Einstein's uh, gravitational bending theory, a special theory of relativity or a general theory, what, one of those things. So he started taking pictures of the sun. Um, it was sometime in May, if I'm not mistaken. So this is 100 years ago, literally from now. In fact, I think almost exactly 100 years ago, this month, anyway. So with that, uh, less than seven years later, he, in 1926, Sir Arthur Eddington comes out with the internal constitution of the stars. And that book became the foundation of stellar mechanics. The idea behind it was that there's radiation being generated inside that is pushing outwards. There's gravity pushing inwards. They saw a small motion, a small, a small movement when the sun approached a star. Um, or, or gravity lens. Really, they call it lensing really, or something, right? Like gravity lensing? Gravity lensing, yes. Okay. Like, now, like suppose, it, so the, 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 the as, as I understood it, right, was as that object massive object moved it was bending the light of the stars that were behind the sun for instance so they had to do it during an eclipse or something like that right so so that the, exactly what they did and they wanted to see that the stars were out of position based mm -hmm. and they and that, and that that was being caused by the gravity but now the uh, other argument is is that no that might be something different right that might have been plasma or something like that that was ca that causes the lensing effect well Okay, I'll give you an example. Then. Okay. If you're on the International Space Station orbiting the Earth, okay, and you know exactly when the sun will be visible when it rises and sets as you go around the planet, because, you know, you're on a space station. Now, if you saw the sun rise with a, before it rose, like it's going through the atmosphere and it has a, a bend and you can see the 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 cr the crest as it does just like a sunrise like you see over an ocean okay, okay. And they're looking over the pacific ocean they see it come up and then of course it hovers there for a while and then morphs and sort of changes a little bit in shape because of distortion and atmospheric distortion and then continues on its way and you know it's fully out you know you're looking at it through space and it's not through the atmosphere now, would you think that was called by, caused by gravitational lensing? No. I would accept it as a natural phenomenon, but I wouldn't necessarily like, think, oh, gravity okay, is so doing you were that. on the right. same page. I yeah. agree. We both agree it happened. I would go, holy crap, look at that. Holy crap, look at that. That's beautiful. Right. Okay, we're on the same page. Now, we also know on Earth that the sun technically rises uh, s several minutes prior to it actually being seen. Uh, that's why the sky is red, full of those red colors, because red bends very well through the atmosphere and it curves inwards. 
and as such, it hits your eye. The sky begins to get that scatter of blue as the morning begins. But the reason the sky is blue and the reason the sun looks redder is that effect. The red light bends more, the blue light scatters more. So this is your sunrise. This is what they saw. Now, we both know the sun has an atmosphere, or we could surmise it does since gas giants have atmospheres as well. And that the sun itself, although on fire, must have an atmosphere. So, and I use on fire loosely. Um, so why wouldn't we make that assumption then that, that we're passing through the atmosphere of the sun? And as such, the same thing occurs in around galaxies. Galaxies themselves have a, an atmosphere. They're much more dense than the intergalactic medium. And therefore, based on the laws of refraction, density equates to changes in um, the angle of the light. Well, I guess, okay, so right. So Einstein proposed this. They mm -hmm. created a test to validate it. The test, one test, one test. You're exactly right. That one <laughs> test gave them no the repeats. results they were looking for. Correct. So they just. So then you automatically went. Okay, we proposed the hypothesis, and the test came back. But that doesn't necessarily. I get what you're saying. That doesn't necessarily mean just because they got the desired result doesn't mean it was because of whatever they proposed the reason was. It could have yeah. just been. It could have been because. Yeah. Right. Because that's kind of the way. You, mean, yeah, yeah. Cause it. You're right. Causality. Correlation. Yeah, yeah, does not mean co correlation. So, um, so so yeah. So so it did validate. That there are parts of the theory of relativity, obviously, that work out mathematically. But maybe what, what you're saying is, but that's not. That's not. They what don't happened. actually work out mathematically. Oh, okay. Uh, if you actually, we should expect to see lensing much further and away from the sun. And as such, we should also see lensing around galaxies a lot more. Yeah, because it does um, seem to be a very nonlinear drop-off uh, as far as lensing is concerned. It's very close to the surface. surface of right. The, yeah, yep. it's, it's within a percentage, like very small percentages. Now, the uh, one of the other things that uh, has been – now, I'm going to mention a name here, and uh, for anyone who wants to go look – him up, I re highly recommend it. Uh, in any EU or the Electric Universe 2014 conference, Dr. Ed Dowdy, I think that's how to pronounce it, D-O-W-D-Y-E, uh, maybe, Dowdy, um, Dowdy, something like that. Uh, he's from NASA. He's an astrophysicist, and he challenges uh, Einstein's theory of, and his he proposes exactly as I proposed. Uh, well, actually, I actually stole his idea and proposed it to you. So um, <laughs> I'm going to just say it straight up. So um, I, I don't want to purport it's mine, uh, obviously. But it obviously, uh, Dr. Dowdy did not invent uh, optical lensing. Uh, but we do have it under good authority that optical lensing is real and works as I'm wearing glasses. So. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so at the same yeah, it's, time, it's then, a science. It's a known science for it, sure. Exactly. Optics. Yeah. I mean, no one's going to argue with this. So uh, to go a little bit further, then he uh, made a proposal uh, at that. He, he basically described uh, this problem with the distances. Uh, it should occur much more, uh, much further out. He also noted that these Einstein rings, as they're called, um, are are bent um, significantly uh, and as such, very close to the objects they're supposed to be bent by. Uh, and as such, they're also blue. All of them are blue. Uh, and uh, in, in a plasma environment, blue light bends more. Uh, in the atmosphere of the Earth, the water scatters blue very well. Um, so it's different. But... Uh, when it comes to the atmosphere of space, it seems that uh, it uh, the blue is is indicative of this. Now, 
we can forgive them for not having color photographs way back when, <laughs> when they were taking pictures, when they thought that the when, when he proposed this, by the way, the internal constitution of plans, Eddington, this is 1926. Okay. They were still debating the ether. Uh, Schrodinger was calling these guys absolute nutballs. He couldn't believe that they were doing this because he said, you can't, you can't destroy this. Like this is a wave. And if the wave is traveling from point A to point B and it has a speed and it has a frequency as Dr. Einstein won the Nobel prize for, um, which he deservedly. So we, that theory is what we use to, to get energy from solar panels, for example. I know how much energy is in a waveform, but the speed stays the same. However, the frequency of the light changes. And uh, that means that higher frequencies have more energy. Um, and of course, uh, certain things resonate with certain frequencies, all that jazz. But at the same time, though, you can see that uh, uh, the light traveling through space is waving something. You can't it's it's like saying, well, there's energy in the ocean waves. OK, but I don't really believe in an ocean. Say what? Like, that's literally what the question is. It's like there's sound hitting my ears. I mean, but I don't believe in sound. I don't believe in air or something. Um, well, light has both uh, has it has the ability to what be a, to act like both a particle and. Uh, it's sort of got a split personality too, on top of well, everything the, else, it's right? It's called wave particle duality. Yeah, um, it's because the they use a kinetic model for the force of it. Even when I'm calculating how much energy I can get from a solar panel, uh, I'm still using uh, Newton's law in there to uh, to uh, describe it as a particle. And how much force it will apply to moving an electron and so forth. Okay. I know that sounds very weird, but it's Well true. no, but no, but it is weird. That's the thing. It's it's it is weird. It's not I get where you're coming from, right? That it's it's mm -hmm. easy to say that all of this is completely settled and understood, but it's it's really oh, not. No. It's not uh, settled and understood. Uh, there's the, the slot experiments that cause there's all kinds of things well, that the double happen. slit experiment is yeah. actually much more easier to understand yeah, than most people but think. that's light acting like a particle and a mm, wave at the same time wave. right is what that experiment or yeah it's bizarre that's what i mean like when you really well, start looking let, at let me it. let me help you clarify a few things number one the double slit experiment works with just one quote-unquote particle corpuscle or whatever they want to call it uh of light as it one photon as they say this is their mass. This is their particle. This photon travels along and it goes through the slit. And every time they fire one photon, it seems to create a wave pattern eventually, one photon at a time, even though there's no nothing to interact with. Because uh, they thought it was interacting with other light particles going through the other slit. That would be how you would do it with normal light like, or normal um, sound, for example. Well, the answer is a little bit easier. The fact is, is that the light is not confined to one space. It has a shell around it, and that shell, some of that shell will pass through the other slit. And this is where this waveform starts appearing. It's like a torus traveling through space. It's actually twisting more than a wave. But um, the argument, of course, is... Uh, to some, that um, uh, light uh, is a particle, of course. But we're beginning to realize now that, just as we started in the 1960s or so, that uh, uh, there's no reason, if I just look at the particles, quote-unquote particles, of matter, and there's no reason then that I can't throw this, uh, this the wallet on my desk here through um, that wall. Because if I just look at the particles, but it's not a collision of particles because there's a vast amount of space. It's the same thing as when you talk about galaxies colliding. No star should hit each other. What are we talking about? There's a collision of forces. And the collision of forces yep. is, is electromagnetic. 
Now, we don't know the answer to a lot of these questions. As you said, you're saying, oh, it's all settled. To some, that might be true. But the big questions are real simple and hard to answer. For example, what is mass? Just what is it? What is Coulomb charge? We understand heat. We can understand kinetics pretty good. You know, like the stress and torsion of materials. Right. But when a material breaks and is ripped apart, what is what is that? Um, what what is happening to the material? Is it really material? Then, if we get right down to it, if what is holding it together are these electromagnetic forces, then in actuality, perhaps almost everything, like a a, a proton itself, could just be nesting of other charges inside of itself. Yeah, and that. It, what we call an electron is a response to that proton being in existence, much like um, uh, if you were to say, for example, instead of using the gravity model exactly, but you know how they say stretch out a sheet, a uh, garbage bag, and then use marbles or whatever, you can picture what gravity is. Right. Well, yep. in a similar yep. sense, throw a marble onto that and say that's a that's a charge. Um, that's a that's one proton uh, with whatever goes on inside it. We know protons are bigger than electrons. Uh, but what is this electron? If the electron could just come, it could come out of existence just to orbit it, it could just be the response to the dent that the proton the charge makes. This is an argument that where the ether really is, if there is an ether. What is waving uh, when you have light passing through something? We know that light is passing through. We know that it, it waves. We know it refracts and all this other wonderful stuff. We know that there's a material there because in electrical theory, Maxwell's equations, um, I have to know the permittivity and permeability of empty space, Yeah, which is like saying I need to know the viscosity and whatever of oil. Yep. You know, whatever the weight and viscosity of oil uh, is the same principle as the permeability and permittivity of empty space. Uh, it it determines how things flow <laughs> yeah. and how things uh, and well, how waves will pass through it. So so in the military, um, my rate was AT, avionics technician, and our insignia was an atom. And mm -hmm. I took electronics all the way through high school. OK, so I've been intimately in you know, technical education, you know, learning how all of this stuff works, the math, the formulas behind electricity. And I was probably in my 30s before I ever heard a scientist or a, a physicist explain the distance, relatively speaking, between an electron and a proton or the nucleus of an atom, rather, right? Like how far apart those things are based on the size. And like I think they use the example like of a city, like if the nucleus was in this city, the electron would be, you know, 60 miles that way if the nucleus was the size of a basketball. Like they're like oh, yeah. they're just almost entirely made up of nothing. Like yes. there's nothing there. So like you're saying, so when you really just like the solar system. Yeah, exactly. And when you and when you when you if you were to break down, like if you could get down to below the the what they call it the Planck scale, and really look mm -hmm. at how these things are connected together, they're not. There's nothing there, really. It's just right. this the, these electrical forces that sort of hold all of this together that create anything, and, and then that fascinated me. So it's like, okay, so you're ninety percent nothing. <laughs> and, and but but electrical but well, that nothing probably even more than that that but not, yeah. yeah yeah right like ninety eight percent nothing but it's but these electrical charges sort of keep everything held together to create yeah. matter and if I accelerate that nothingness to about Mach five and slam it into the side of a battleship she explodes too yeah right so <laughs> that nothingness can do something it, yeah it's very powerful well how right. can this nothingness have mass what is mass yeah then. How can it have heat? How does heat get transferred? We know that we can do these thermal and kinetic conversions. Uh, anyone who studies ballistics would have to know that. Um, and, of course, engines and so forth. And we understand that there is a connection between electricity and um, 
uh, all of these formulas. Yeah, it's weird because you, different materials, the, the, that electrical connection in that material is much stronger and resilient to change than in other. It's, it's like, but it's all the same thing though, right? It's, all, it's still all these weird electrical connections between atoms that get together and form molecules that form matter, well, yeah, right? There, and we don't even know. I mean, we have really very little to go on when it comes to uh, I'm, uh, our theories. Uh, like, even me, who just a few years ago uh, was taking uh, advanced electronics, I still learned, I still was taught the Bohr model, the B-O-H-R model of, yep. Yep. of, of atoms, which has a kinetic uh, um, a speed of light orbit of the electron and the kinetic energy that it must have, blah, 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 blah. And then we learned that, uh, no, quantum, it doesn't have that. It has uh, these, these shells, and these shells have these shapes. And then quarks move in uh, these type of fashions, and you're like, whoa. And then there's spooky action at a distance, and you're like, whoa, 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 what's going on here? And this is where uh, it begins to break down because they're trying to find smaller and smaller examples of things without actually discovering well, then, then the bolt, real stuff that bolt, I think is much more important. Bolt quantum entanglement on top of that. It's like, Man, this is this. That's what I meant. Spooky action at distance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly right. Yeah, it, 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 like a, a lot of really sort of, um, I don't know, like fi- a lot of really strange shit starts to happen. And, well, and traveling up back, up back up along that line, gravity became the dominant force of the universe because of that situation that occurred there with uh, with the internal constitution of the planets, and then as it moved along. Uh, principles uh just like pr- principles were um established and broken uh repeatedly the first one was uh they were trying to explain uh pulsars so in trying to explain these pulsars that they were talking about here is, is astrophysicists astrophysicists of the time this is right? a few years later yeah okay. after the hubble constant was discovered hubble did his thing and then you're moving along to uh the 1950s and 60s and so okay. and in that era they were dealing with pulsar problems because pulsars existed and they were showing an oscillation we began to calculate that the that they weren't solid light they were turning on and off uh then they came up with the idea that it was a rotating lighthouse it's spinning it's you know doing its thing um and as such they were like okay that's cool we're cool with that i can do i can deal with that and they think that it's just lucky that we're getting brushed with this uh this uh passing light beam like a lighthouse and then it was fine until we started finding uh, these pulsars that were going around 30,000 revolutions a second. Right. And they were like, wait, 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 we, have, we can't do that. Okay, well, maybe, maybe they're made of a different material. Please speak your mind, sir. We are totally bullshitting ourselves. Let's bullshit with you. Well, here's my theory. <laughs> yeah. My untested hypothesis that we could never test on the ground, which is really good because that would mean, you know, we'd have to actually admit to this. But let's go. So I'm going to say that all – imagine all of that space that we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, that's space. Okay. That space is now filled with only neutrons. How heavy would that material be? Oh, my God. It'd be super heavy. Super, super duper heavy. Just one giant planet-sized atom, like 12 miles across. And we'll call this matter neutronium. I like it. Okay. Now, this will hold together spinning 30,000 times a second. It would. It would have enough gravity. Wow. Well, then we solve the problem. And then someone would say, well, what about the Isle of of, uh, Stability model with regards to nuclear chemistry? Uh, Well, okay. Sure. Screw those guys. We're just going to do our own thing. And that's what they did. Untested, nothing else. And then it became that. Then the next problem occurred where they started uh, theorizing, actually. And it was uh, Suleiman Chandrasekhar, who was a student of 
uh, Eddington, actually. And he said, uh, let's just uh, skip the middleman, divide by zero on this. I like it. I like it. It's good. Yeah, right. Yeah. And that's it. The black hole was born. And Eddington said, you can't do that. And he goes, watch me. And in a nutshell, this is the beginning of uh, – then they found them. They found black holes. Um, and then they eventually said that supermassive black holes are everywhere. And uh, and then, of course, this led to wormholes and uh, pretty much all of Star Trek, really. Yeah, the bridge, the Einstein. Um, Rosen Bridge. Rosen Bridge, yep. yep. Well, well, that means that if they made a mistake that far back, then you have to, if we just cut that line off and say it's wrong, then that's the other line that's left over is the line that is most likely correct. And it involves basically saying that electromagnetism uh, doesn't end at the edge of the earth, that engineers and others can tell you that if the earth is charged and it has an ionosphere, which proves that it is, then there are not only charges flowing, but it, it works like this. These are how the charges would move. This is how a homopolar motor works. Faraday taught us this. Ampere taught us that. Coulomb taught us that. This is how this is working. This is why the spiral in the galaxy. And that's it. You know, it's just, that's why things look like hourglass shapes because so there's 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 a there's so the confusion here then in in this in the hypothesis is that there was there were there they were giving all of the credit for what the sort of things that holds everything together to gravity and and st- not and, to and, disparage and, Newton because he was a blooming genius so okay but but there you're saying that it's at, yes there's gravity but there's mm-hmm. also an electrical component to it that's often lumped in to the gravity equation that's not sort mm-hmm. of being separated out and accounted for on its own, right? Uh, correct. Okay. And there seems to be even more than that. Like, uh, it, it appears that uh, only gravity only plays a role when things are relatively calm, like right now. Uh, we are orbiting. Things are generally peaceful. We're stable. Uh, when things are stable... Uh, gravity is obviously the dominant force. Uh, that does not mean that gravity cannot somehow be modified or that charge and gravity together can influence plants. And the, this becomes obvious when I tell you why. <clears throat> because uh, we note that comets should be snow and ice, uh, but we landed on one and we took an ice drill to it and it broke and goes, wow, this is very strong ice. Yes, it's black and it's, tr- and it's, and it's, and it's as strong as rock. Well, cause well, that's, then it's rock. Well, that's probably cause that's what it is, right? <laughs> but it's mass. It's, it's, it's mass and tells us that it should be snow and ice. It's not that dense for its size. Okay. But it's rock. So either the rock is full of holes or it's hollow or, and it's going to be hard to convince me of that considering it's shaped like a barbell, but uh, this comet then, uh, the things that we think are happening are supposed to be snow and ice ejecting from it, from plumes that are being heated, but uh-huh. the item itself is not very hot. Like the, 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 we landed on it and it's sitting there. It's not hot at all. Like it's not it's not hot there at all on this on the surface of this thing. So where is all this coming from? Well, it's coming from the fact that this this object, this uh, rock, is on an elliptical orbit, and it begins to get closer and closer to the anode, which is the sun. And as it crosses into the inner solar system, if you can do that whole understand how much space there is, the sun is not that big. The solar system is absolutely massive. Uh, the distance between the Earth and the Sun is millions and millions and millions of miles. Right. So uh, you have this uh, you have this comet coming in very close to this anode, and as such, it begins to discharge. It cannot deal 
with the amount of electrons it has to process um, because you're basically putting it through uh, a layer. It has a charge to it, so it, it forms a capacitive layer around itself, uh, just like we have an ion the ionosphere and the Van Allen belts. It gets something similar to that, but it's moving quite quickly. So it, the, this is quickly torn away, uh, so to speak, and becomes a tail. And it's just burning material off of this rock, and it begins to combine uh, the H's from this uh, rock it's and the silicates. It's, it's doing it electrically, the, uh, though, is what you're saying, yes, right? Like, this exactly. isn't peeling it off by, like, well, a blowtorch. The solar wind is, has a charge to it, yeah. and as you, and as you and it's co breaking the down sun, those you're building electrical, up the gradient. You're breaking down the electrical connections. It's holding shit together, and it's flying off. Yes. It's kind of what Coulomb's you're saying. Coulomb's law, force equals K. Q1, Q2 over R squared. But this isn't this isn't in the sense of like EDM, electronic discharge machining would be. Or it is. So it, there's like microscopic is. little lightning bolts blasting Well, they're right, down, they're right down on the surface of that stuff, and it's pulling material out. Now, yeah. uh, and of course, it can do this slowly, uh, and the material will recombine. But you know it's in glow mode. It's arcing. Or sorry, it's in glow mode. Sorry, it's not arcing. But the arcing is probably right near the surface just like it is on the sun the sun has an electrical influence all the way up to the heliopause so think of that as your crook's tube or your um, fluorescent bulb so the fluorescent bulb has a positive and negative end the negative end is the heliopause the positive end is the sun and as you take a, uh, your bb which is the comet and you fling it down towards the center of this thing uh it begins to discharge as it gets close to the, the source of power, the sun. Now, the sun's only the source of power here, of course, because it is taking power from the its environment. It's not making anything uh, besides being its electrical load. Uh, the All the action is happening at the surface. Uh, that's why the magnetic prominences are occurring there. That's why there's sunspots occurring there. Uh, that's why there's a frequency to it, uh, the 11-year cycle. Uh, uh, there's other ones like the Maunder minimum, the 630 year cycle. Um, these cycles are probably influenced by the current that's traveling into the poles and out along the elliptic. And that's the solar wind. Uh, of so course. that's like what we're moving through in the cosmos. Like that's the other thing, right? Is that, it, yeah, it, we are attached to actually, we are attached to a tube that's called the local chimney and with several other stars in a ring. And that and that ring of stars are uh, like a they have their own heliospheres, yeah. and these heliospheres are sort of in a ring around Antares. Um, so probably a long time ago, we were much like an hourglass nebula. And if you look at pictures of like a supernova uh, 1987A, I think it's called, uh, you can see that it, there's a ring around it. And just like those rings in the future, a, the, the, it, the supernova went off, there's an hourglass shape to it, uh, and you can see the ring. And that ring is expanding outwards and getting brighter. Yeah. And then now it's going to probably be several suns. Several stars will be in a ring around that. There'll be a star in the middle when it calms down and expands wider and wider and begins more diffuse, and that, that hourglass shape will disappear because there's no longer enough current to make it glow. So you won't see the heliopause. Like, we don't see the heliopause here, and we don't see the galactic chimney. We just know it's there. We sense it with uh, the radio noise and other things around it. Then here we are, like, in the situation that we're currently in here with Earth and uh, the sun. Uh, it's the leftovers of an explosion from God knows how long ago. And we are still uh, the motion that we think we have when we say it's we're spiraling through the cosmos this many miles. Of, no, we have no evidence of this. <laughs> we we base this all on on Doppler shifts and light. Well, that's, right, because we I, don't know if that's even true, though. That 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 the I always you know again when you think of the solar system, you think of this big bright spot. Mm -hmm. And planets in a nice flat rings just sort of orbiting because that's the model that was in every classroom 
and it's and not now, bad. True. And now I it understand. Did work for a long time. But that never made any sense to me because it was like, well, why doesn't these planets go over the top? And the, you know, like, okay, I guess there's gravity, uh, whatever. That's a good question. You know. Well, it makes perfect sense. The same reason why the rings of Saturn are around the ring where the rings are. Yeah. The same reason why all the moons, besides the, our moon, yeah, are right along the uh, like the equator. Elliptic, or, okay. the equator. Sorry. Equator. So, so, but when you, but then, it, then someone, then I saw something that was no, the sun's moving through space, and mm-hmm. we're sort of like orbiting or tracked in like its tail, as it were. Not like so. That's why everything has to line up a certain direction. Is there's there's other forces at play, but I never understood. Well, I never thought about the fact that the sun's through, moving. The, yeah, yeah. The the sun. We have a current flow, and that's probably what they're detecting, mm-hmm. but. The reason that we ha- the planets orbit like they do, you know this when you think about it, is okay. You're orbiting along the area which has a neutral point. Uh, if you go up too high, you're going to begin to become more a bigger load on the circuit uh, because you're going to cross more and more lines of flux as you get closer to the pole. Uh, as you as your orbit is close like that, so it's going to want to, the right hand rule is going to push your planet on an angle yeah. around that donut core, so to speak, around the sun's. If the sun has it's like a core of an apple, yeah. and you're going to swing inwards, and as you do so, you're going to lower your angle, and over time you will go along the elliptic. Yeah, that's where you'll want to be, and at that, as such, of course, you will also be right in the path of a whole whack of ions which are flying by and they're and they're and as such they pull your electric field and magnetic field and this is why the sun has or the earth has a magneto tail and the and venus has a plasma tail we should just call them plasma tails at this point but <laughs> because they're made they're literally magnetic and electric and they have plasmoids in them so i mean there's a plasmoid right behind the earth every night um, but you can't see it, but we know it's there uh, because the tail has a, the, I mean, they say twisting magnetic fields, blah, 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 the flux ropes, blah, 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 blah. No, it's just, it, it was described a long time ago by Irving Langmuir and, and, uh, and of course he coined plasma and then later came uh, Bostic and uh, he called them plasmoids. And that's what they are, semi Semi, they almost seem to be alive. They're like almost organic cells of, um, like, like an eddy pool behind a rock in a stream, but they take on a life of their own because of the right hand rule and such. And they, and they form a basic torus. And this uh, is out beyond the moon, of course. And that's and that's every. I mean, there's probably several in in some uh, planets' tails. So let's talk about real quick because you and I uh, have been throwing this this term right hand rule around because mm-hmm. we're because we're we're nerds. <laughs> yeah. But let's explain to that what that is. Is that the right hand rule explains that if you have current flow in a given direction, that the lines of fuck flux, not fucks, flux rotating around <laughs> that conductor or that. Uh, current will will travel in a certain direction, so That's you can correct. determine the, the the direction of the line of flux basically by the direction of the uh, current flow, and that's why they call it the right hand rule. So if you imagine your thumb being the direction of current through a wire, for instance, mm-hmm. your fingers wrapping around the wire, if you're if you were grabbing it with your thumb pointing towards the direction of the current flowing through the wire, would indicate which direction the lines of flux are rotating around around. That Correct. conductor, and then when you change the jer- the current to the other direction, you have to still use your right hand, but you flip your hand again with your thumb pointing towards where the current is now flowing, and the line you can see and the, the, the lines of flux one reverse. Is the uh, the other one, of course, is that's where you're. If you were to think about making a gun, but with your hand, but pointing your middle finger to ninety degrees to the pistol barrel with your index finger. Then you would. That's the other right hand rule, which gives you your. Um, it gives you your current being your uh, thumb, your index or your uh, your uh, middle finger would be wrapping around, and the force applied would be your index finger. 
and the because the force is 90 degrees to the uh magnetic field so you're going to have this uh this gives you your uh that kick i was talking about when they because of the right hand rule uh it, it it pulled it in along that edge that's where the force went and so it had to it followed that force move the planets and put them more along this elliptic basically out away from the poles because the poles have way too much friggin current near them um and we see these the the sphere rules coming into the poles of the sun um which seem to indicate that they're basically uh hydrogen or atoms are basically heading out to the heliopause they're neutralizing there and being pumped uh this is why the um the uh, Voyager uh, passed through the heliopause several times. Uh, and it did so because it's, that's the pumping action that we're seeing. And uh, that pumped those uh, using those same electromagnetic principles to the poles to be uh, repurposed, so to speak, and sent back down. Of course, there's more connected. And of course there's current traveling through this whole print, this whole thing. So, it's not like it's um, you know not being fed by something. It's not an automatic process. Um, but then now I think we have the ability to answer that question. What, does... what the heck is that picture? Oh, I, so... and I, 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 yeah, and I agree. Let me ask you this, okay? So, so you you guys sort of view um, the co cosmo uh, cosmically that the universe is sort of electrically entangled then through uh, different polarities and, and um, uh, electrical uh, attraction and repulsion, like magnetic attraction and repulsion, like putting magnets together the right way, wrong way, and this kind of <laughs> stuff, right? So that's... so Not quite, but close, yeah. Okay, but what... So what does... And I get that. Like, you can kind of look at it and go, well, then fucking everything's electrically connected. And, and, well, and if it you is... You already know. Yeah. You already know that electrical forces are generated by magnetic fields. You know yeah. that. And there's a direct connection between the two. Well, there are magnetic fields in space, and we know this. Sure. So okay. it's a simple if-then statement. So if there are magnetic fields, then there are electric fields done. What? There's no such thing as a giant physical magnet in space or something. Then what does viewing things that way, or sort of with that, it's, it's gravity and electrical entanglement, right? What mm -hmm. does it hurt to look? I mean, what? You know, you understand what I'm saying? Like, how does why this, does it hurt? Uh, yeah, how does this? How is this uh, any kind of challenge? Uh, because, because really, to the, to the mainstream? Yeah. Well, I mean, well, that's what I'm saying. Why does it? Well, it answers all the enigmas. They're answer. They're asking questions out of the blue all the time. Okay. And they're surprised by the answers, but these answers are predicted in the electric model. Okay. Like, just read. You know, like you, and you'll know some of them, like. Um, when the, uh, the impactor was sent to Comet Temple 1, uh, we said, oh, you're going to send a copper projectile that weighs one and a half tons towards a charged body in space. There's going to be quite a big explosion. And sure enough, it overwhelmed the sensors. It was so big. I never imagined the explosion could be that big. And the explosion happened seven miles from the surface. The, the surface. Right. Like it didn't even touch. It was like zerch and blasted that thing to pieces, you know. And it was much bigger than 67P. Uh, but uh, still, that's an example. Uh, uh, every time they are wondering why there's sunspots, it's a collapsed double layer. That's why the sun is dark on the inside because the it's, it has a surface. Well, how can the sun have a surface? It has to be made of gas because we do calculations. And we see it's made of hydrogen and the earth must be heavy because, and have an iron core because we do mass calculations and it says so. But what if mass is variable depending on say, perhaps maybe surface current or something like that? Uh, if that's the case, then, then we cannot in any way predict the density of any material in space at all or any planet. We can, and that's why, how we calculated everything. Everything is based on the universal gravitational constant. But if it's not universal, 
Well, it right. It only exists on Earth. We used to have a universal yeah. light constant, too. Boy, that went out the fucking window, didn't it? Like, the speed of light is not constant. Well, we know that now. It, it isn't. It isn't. So, now, yeah. Here's the, but the reason this is all happening, and they're trying to cover that shit up, the trouble is, is that it seems that many things are variables when we thought they were constants. Radioactive decay rates are variable depending on the electric field that they're immersed in. Uh, you have a decay, the um, uh, the light, as you have mentioned, of course, uh, is dependent. Uh, even the lines of spectrum, there's a thing called the Zener effect. If you have a high electric field and you shoot light through it, it widens or narrows or moves the lines. So things we're looking at saying, oh, that's made of carbon. You don't have a frigging clue what that is. You might not be right. If it's highly charged, you're most likely wrong. And it explains things like uh, pulsars. Pulsars are now just relaxation oscillators. Uh, they're two fields, uh, like the two fields of two suns close together, going womp, 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 just like that. That's all it's doing. And one has more capacitance than the other. That's it. And uh, so that explains those. That's why you don't need anything rotating really fast. You don't need neutron stars. You just basically need two plasma shells nearby. Oh, you mean like pulsars nearby to a uh, something like, for example, most of the pulsars we know are binaries or trinaries. Well, that's why. Simple. And therefore, black holes and galaxies themselves are just more of the homopolar motor effect. Uh, not the not the black holes themselves. Obviously, there's some of that going on, but the black holes are really just high energy plasmoids, uh, and they become such that their magnetic fields are twisted, and they will shoot beams out their top and bottom, and each beam will be of a different polarity. One will be positive, one will be negative, and this is exactly what we see. These are made in the laboratory. We're not asking for anything except for some people. We say that space behaves exactly like charged gas does in the laboratory. That's all we're saying. Everything else is an extrapolation of that. The, uh, the EM forces don't end on, on the Earth's surface. We know a lot about them. The power grid, uh, the, this computer, the cell phones, everything. We know tons about this stuff. But apparently... The moment you say that the Earth and space are charged, well, the astrophysicists get all in a pinch. Well, I got to tell you, there's 500,000 volts between the Earth and the ionosphere, and the ionosphere is 50 kilometers away. So let me do the math. The, cap the capacitance of that planet then has to do is, – is proportional to the voltage – and it would be inversely proportional to the distance. So all we need to do is throw in the dielectric constant and a few other things, and this is a capacitor. Then we could figure out C. Well, at that point, what the heck are capacitance, we talking Capacitance, it's about ability that? to store energy. It's and how many coulombs does yep. the Earth hold? Right. And then how much charge attraction does it have to other bodies? In, irrespective of gravity. Because it functions exactly the same. The formula for gravity and the formula for Coulomb charge is identical, except that one has a big G as a constant, the other one has a K as a constant. Mm -hmm. And one deals with mass and the other one deals with charge. So there is a direct relationship to charge and mass right there. Faraday said, if I could only figure out the, the relation, no, no amount of, no amount of, understatement would express something with regards to basically it would be a really big deal um and he also said inductance is to magnetism as gravity is to capacity or sorry capacitance is to gravity because we can make an atomic magnet but as strong as we think that magnet is an electromagnet of exactly the same size would be absolutely stupendously powerful comparatively okay uh no matter how good of a think of the best neobidium magnets that can crush your hand if you get them two between right. each other yeah they're insane right yeah right well if i got two magnets that were electromagnets 
I could crush a car between them. Of the same, of <laughs> yeah, the same you know size. Yeah, yeah. So that's no matter how powerful you think the atomic force is, that's just atoms, just the rotating right. of atoms going around in a, in a spiral that's giving that magnet its power. And electromagnet is working on the macro scale. And it's actually a spinning bunch of current, like amps and amps of it. Yeah. So you're going to get a much more powerful and magnetic field. And this is where the idea of how powerful it, why do suns have a magnetic field in the first place? What does this mean? Well, in this environment, it means that there's a charge or current flowing into the poles of our planet out along the elliptic. And the result is an overall magnetic field. The, there's no, nothing being generated in the core. Like we picture the north south bar magnet crap, there is a current traveling in the poles. Now, one is stronger than the other. That one that's stronger is giving us our overall magnetic field for the planet. Okay. The, the south is stronger. Yeah. So it is the north magnetic pole. Uh, our north, our, now I know that sounds weird, but our north pole is our south magnetic pole. So just if you put that in your head, because <laughs> a north, a, 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 a compass has a north pole, a north part of the magnet, yeah. and it points north. That's the south. So it is, oh, it's so it's it to south poles. To, yeah, it wouldn't be, <laughs> yes. it would be repelled if it was the same polarity, yes, right? See, yeah, you're getting it. Yeah. yeah, that's all I meant. Okay. So uh, it, it, it just, uh, but magnetically speaking, then this is how, um, this is how it is. So this, this is why there's an overall around the planet and that, why they're not stable. And the sun, of course, has these bands and spirals in it. And you can see the twisting and the prominences coming off it. Jupiter has bands rotating in different directions all the time. Uh, and they're spiraling. The equator is the boundary line between the two. And it does this because this is literally, uh, you have a current coming in. It goes along the disk. Okay, and spirals as it does so, gets to the edge of the disk, and then is uh, emits its current to uh, to the the wire or the negative charge. And this is the the Faraday, the natural Faraday disk, that thing that you do with a paper clip and a battery and a magnet. You just stick them together, and then suddenly you have a motor. It starts spinning. That's the same effect. What do we get? So, what do we get, Neil? If 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 we get mainstream, like you said, if if we get if you get you get to say, hey, look, we're just making this proposition that this sh that it exact it ex um it acts well, in space the way it acts in the lab. As an engineer, you know? there's it's a, if it, as engineers, you know, it's an if then thing. It's not a it's not a matter. These things have been proven beyond a shadow of a doubt. Oh, I get that. Okay, so let's say we get but, the, we but, get, but right. you're right. There is more to explore. It's not like we know everything. That's what. But what do we get if we get that? If we get the switch. What do, what, mm -hmm. what do you think the implications of that are? I mean, do I get cool shit? Like, oh, do I get yep. do I get Luke Skywalker's land speeder and anti gravity? Do I get stuff yeah. like that? I mean, because gravity is not explained. Gravity is a consequence of 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 uh, the bending of space and time, whatever the frack that means. <laughs> so, uh, and and if it's now a consequence of an electrical phenomenon in the charge of the Earth or something then it's manipulable. You can change it. We can start affecting it. Now, what, what is stopping us from affecting it now is that it seems to be unshieldable and it seems to be inside of protons or something. We don't exactly know, but maybe it's as simple as, uh, maybe it's as simple as uh, uh, charge has a effect on uh, gravity. Mass is variable. Uh, then that means the sun is not really made of hydrogen. The sun could simply be a rock, just like the Earth is a rock, just like Mars is a rock, Venus is a rock, and everything that we see is a rock. Then the gas giants, we know, even though they're not telling you, we know that the atmosphere of Jupiter is no more than 3,000, 300 or 3,000, I can't remember the number, uh, kilometers thick. Um, and then they say there's a solid surface, but they say they don't say solid. They say in like they basically they're trying to say solid, but meaning gas form, the same shit they say on the sun. It's not that the sun has a liquid surface, probably because it's everything is friggin lava. And this stuff is being ejected up and thrown in the air and then dropped back down by these prominences. Uh, mountains are made and born and sticking out of the thing and then they drop back down. The same thing probably happened to the Earth is probably happening on Jupiter. Jupiter is not made of gas. 
Saturn is not made of gas. They, they think they're made of gas because we do the math and they say, okay, well, we do the math and it says it should be gas. But that's because we are basing it off the universal gravitational whatever. If those two highly charged bodies have a different mass because of electricity or whatever, then when we get there, they're going to be rocks. They're going to have rocks on the surface, just like everything else does. And there's no reason to think technically that that's not the same for everything. So the only thing that would mean is that why is everything a sphere would probably be because of the pinch effect, just like those uh, plasmoids. Some of them have, uh, especially those ones that are probably black holes, um, are pinching so strongly that the Lorentz force takes all material in an area and crushes it into a sphere and then shoots it out to the side. Um, this happens in when you're welding, for example, you, this little dust that you see everywhere. And when you're welding the, if you look under a microscope, they're little tiny spheres and it's just the electric pinch effect doing its thing. Um, now this little pinch makes a sphere. It, uh, uh, that's probably much why, why there, everything we see is a sphere. Sometimes it's improperly well, there's a, formed. There's an efficiency and, to spheres for sure. Of course. You know? Well, and it makes perfect sense. Why? Because if, for example, you had one, just picture a sphere um, in space, and it's going to be our, our, a star for our intents and purposes here, and I'm uh, putting a current through it, uh, and it has a magnetic field to it, uh, so it's going to start to do its spinning thing and all that lovely stuff. But as I continue turning it up and turning up the current, it's going to start glowing. First, it's going to glow red. It's going to glow with this wonderful wispy glow, and then it's going to pull in as it starts going to arc mode. And it's going to be just along the surface. And then the surface is going to be turning to uh, reddish yellow, then to yellow, then to uh, yellow white, and then so on, all the way up to bluish white. It's as hot as it can possibly get. And the current per square meter is any hotter, any, sorry, any more current per square meter. And the Coulomb force is going to uh, exceed the planet's ability to hold the charge between the two plates. So basically, it's going to have a dielectric breakdown. Now, let's say that we do that. We turn it up again. Now, it explodes. What it does is it's going to have a bunch of pinches happen uh, during this explosion, but all the electrons are going to rush to the point where the, the positive core touched the surface, and it's going to barf out another planetoid. Uh, maybe shrinking itself in the process, maybe, I don't know if it could puke out the innards of itself, I don't really know, but at the end result will be two spheres. Now, these two spheres have the same amount of material in volume, but they now have a markedly larger surface area. So now they can conduct more, more electricity per cubic meter and survive because they are a load on the circuit. And they will survive if they have a more enough surface area. And this means that every the surface area of all the planets in the solar system are processing all the current through it. The sun, of course, being the largest surface as tracking the most current. That makes okay. It, yeah. It's simple because you know that's how that works. So the, yeah, because <laughs> because because electrically the load's gonna be shared. Um, according to some exponent here, which is surface area, but then it's going to be shared. It's going to be affected but, but the, by the magnetic fields because the magnetic field of the sun is going to sort of want to pull it towards itself down the poles. Yeah. If you know what I mean? But it's still going to be, the more that goes in the sun, the more solar wind we have that pushes out along the planets anyway. So it's, you know, we'll call them A, we'll call them B. Hey, this might be off topic uh, a little yeah. bit, but I want to ask you this because, because I think there's implications here with the whole plasma guys and the electric universe guys. Uh, with uh, these uh, plasma uh, fusion reactors that like places like mm -hmm. China and stuff are starting to fire up. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, because, cause, because, I mean, plasma is what, the fourth state of matter or fourth state of energy or something like that, right? So this is like a whole new, it's kind of a whole new thing, but I find it really ironic that... It's the, actually really ironic because it's not, it is the first state of matter. Is that, it oh, is the, you, they've got it backwards. It's, it's, everywhere, yeah. it's everywhere in the universe. Every single place we look besides plus or minus a few kilometers on the surface of this rock. Yeah. 
or the surface of rocks generally <laughs> like 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 mars is quite high in 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 ions uh, because it's very thin atmosphere uh -huh. but we have a pretty thick atmosphere and in it we can have neutral atoms and as such we have all the wonderful things that we exist and enjoy but if you go further up than 10 kilometers it's almost entirely a plasma it's it's i mean it's a dusty plasma it's wispy yeah but it's there and well, you go higher and higher, and that's the same thing. You just enter into plasma. Well, they're, they're building these reactors now, and the the shape of them are toroidal, which I thought was I was like, oh, huh, <laughs> like I just because there's I know there's implications with toroidal shapes. Uh, you know, we were talking about electromagnets and different things earlier, and uh, but but then they use plasma, um, mm -hmm. a, a plasma field as the way of containing these temperatures. And uh, so there's got to be parallels there to what they're doing. Those in... will always fail. You think so? Uh, the Takamak uh, reactor yeah, Takamak. Based, yep. On, yep. Uh, based on uh, magnetohydrodynamic theory. Yep. And it's a mathematical version of plasma that basically says it should behave this way if we do everything right. Yeah. But the moment you turn the darn thing on, what they're trying to do is they're trying to make a magnetic containment bottle. Yep. Uh so it doesn't touch the sides, and they they, they use a superheated uh, plasma in the center of this uh, magnetic torus. Now, in theory, I like it, but in reality, <coughs> just like uh, the Earth has, uh, you might have heard of the, for example, the South American anomaly. Uh, it's a place that's uh, has a different magnetic field than the rest of the Earth, and it's relatively near to the equator, uh, but in South America. Well, if you made a perfectly smooth sphere, and you and you, I mean, I mean, really do the just the best job you possibly could to make it perfectly smooth and round, and then you mount it perfectly, and you do everything perfectly, and you put it really close tolerance to a ring or or other conductor, okay? And we're going to make a band around this uh, this sphere now, uh, and it's, so they're nice and they're really close together, so it's low, low tolerance. I don't think no matter how good you do, you're going to get an even distribution around that ring. What will happen is it will find a point that it likes, and it will sit on that point. And that's exactly what we've found with uh, with uh, all Faraday disks. As much as you want to think that it's going to do a universal, uh, even current, it always filaments. Always. And... It will continue to do so. Now, there are some reactors that we've seen that are better, that have a much better idea behind that, uh, which they're basically using the plasma at, to make a, one of these little pinches that I was talking about. And they're going and they use the magnetic fields to basically make that happen and start a nuclear reaction in the middle. And they heat it up using. Uh, uh, stuff from the outside so basically they turn this into a, a superheated gas to make it a lot easier to ignite into a nuclear reaction and they so i've seen that one now that one has promise because they're basically taking out of the equation trying to control the plasma as much as just basically set it off and what and watch your burn if you know what i mean yeah so I find it all I find it all extremely fascinating because you're right. There's there's several versions of fusion reactors that are sort of mm. sprinting towards the end here, and and uh, well, by all accounts, it looks like that uh, Takamak uh, is the one everybody keeps talking about the most because they seem to be. I think they just I think they just got their test done on helium, so they're going to be moving up. The energy well, scale. yeah, but they were still only able to keep it going for uh, m like very minor amounts of Mill time before milliseconds. Yeah, it yeah, wasn't like before before it filaments. Yeah, that's what's happening. It basically, they, it will never stay smooth. It will always filament, always stick to the side of that thing somewhere. And as soon as it does, it shorts and it's over. And then bloop. Yep, shut it off. And and they shut it off. And that's yeah. like, it's. I mean, you can't do that. Right. I don't think. And, and we've and, and in nature. If 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 it's any consolation for us, if that's the case, then we're looking up into space and we're seeing this happen everywhere. The sun has spots on it. The sun has prominences that pop out of it, and it's a perfect sphere. So, what are you expecting here? 
you know, uh, these things get twisted amongst themselves. You can, you can, you can see it. Our weather has goes in different directions. We spin, we spin tourney or hurricanes off from the equator. And that's why they go up because obviously they're following the right hand rule, but let's not dwell. And, um, that's why they go in the opposite direction of the south, by the way. This Coriolis effect is pointless. It doesn't, that's not what's going on at all. Uh, this is just simply, it's responding to the fact that it's a, it's a current trying to ground out, like a, a hurricane is a grounding, it's a, is a huge electrical current um, grounding out to, to the water. Uh, uh, the, uh, the tornadoes are, are very similar. Uh, they are the exact same effect. They're like uh, basically, you can even see they're a pla they're a plasma tube basically. Right. And they they there's a positive charge in the cloud or a negative charge in the ground, and then they begin to approach each other. But instead of, in because of the atmosphere having a uh, saturation of ions, uh, instead of lightning bolts forming, they start spinning, and in the spinning. Uh, you can see the finger coming down from the top, reaching into a funnel. And then there's a debris cloud at the base, but this, these three effect, these three types of funnels are indicative of exactly what you see in a, in a water bridge. When you are trying to use electricity to build a bridge between two beakers, um, electrically, uh, you, if, when they use food coloring, uh, red in one and green in the other, they saw that the red went through the middle and the green went on the outside because it's different polarities and they're spinning in opposite directions because of the right hand rule and they self reinforce and they self reinforce to the point where they can hold the water up like it's like over top of nothing the water will stay there and right. be connected but it doesn't drain one and fill the other it moves them equally across they're going against each other and this is the same situation that we see in tornadoes and hurricanes and i think that's the uh this is basically what's happening. Uh, also, why they spawn out of, uh, you know, um, uh, what was it called? Burning Man. They make a giant fire with smoke going in the air, releasing all these ions in a very dry desert with not a lot of moisture, which is an inhibitor. And then uh, look at it go. It just makes dust devils, and these dust devils start reaching higher and higher. Um, so it's... it's it's i want to say it's not rocket science but so there's nothing there was nothing in this though that that came as any kind of um and you know coming full circles we kind of start wrapping up um there's nothing that that there was nothing here that really came as any kind of surprise to anybody uh on no they're going to see what they're going to see they yeah. want to see that now but we've seen pictures from our own galaxy sagittarius a with regards to the black hole and we see a lot of these um these plasma plasmoids they and, and we got to be fair, though, when we're looking at these plasmas, we're talking about solar system wide things. Right. Like these and they're highly energetic and we're seeing them only in radio waves. So we're not seeing in ultraviolet. We're not seeing in regular light. So they're probably incredibly bright. We only have the advantage of saying that they're dark because they are occluded from our light because of that dark right. cloud that's going around. And we did the same to the other place. We use radio telescopes to see what we saw. And as you know, or maybe you don't, um, stars look completely different depending on what you're looking at them through. Uh, for example, the brightest star in the Sirius, the uh, Orion's belt there, I think it's uh, Sirius, I think, or something like that. I can't really remember close which one which anyway the the point is is that one of these stars is brighter in in light regular light but in ultraviolet it is the dim one the other one is hugely brighter so that's the uh the bias of our own sight and what our limitations are so they're going to see the uh yeah the, the what, Right, I get what you're saying. How bright or not it is is not necessarily an indication how much energy it's casting off into the cosmos. Well, okay, yeah, right? we're only seeing that little bit, yeah. Yeah. And uh, so, but they see these uh, they see these poles and these jets. But these jets, like I said, they're they're totally predicted in in well, they're not even totally predicted. 
experimentally proven. We can make them over and over and over again in the, in the lab. laboratory. Yeah. Uh, so these are not. Um, they're not the only thing that boggles people's minds is how much how much energy this must be. Where is this energy coming from? And my answer is always this: if there's only like two electrons per cubic meter in the inter stellar medium between you know the sun and the earth or whatever just do a math calculation and figure out how many cubic meters that is and then you have a current and i'll tell you what when you start thinking about how much that is you'll realize how much energy is there because we know how much yeah, empty it, space there is in an atom yeah well the empty space between the sun and the heliopause is 80 astronomical units in a giant sphere right now do the math on that uh, and eat, realize and just pick one electron or whatever you want to do for whatever minimum amounts you want to put in there. You're going to find out that if I compress that energy down to the surface of the sun, it would be like a nuclear yeah. explosion, like Maybe. exactly what you see. Because it, anything that's the heliopause or anything that's going through is this has to be processed on the surface of the sun. The surface of the sun is just a pinhead compared to the size of that thing, yeah. like tiny, tiny, tiny. And the Earth is even smaller than that. So well, maybe that's it, man. You know, I'm going to put my conspiracy theory hat on here for a second, but maybe that's really it. Maybe we we, we just don't want uh, mankind to understand how abundant and available energy actually really is, that it's mm. in, it's insanely abundant. Yes, it's, it's, it's an just, energy abundant universe. Yeah, it's just the way it is. It's a, it looks we, more if you if you step back, you looked at it. If I, I we did interrupt, but if you looked at it, it's more like. Uh, it's more like you're dealing with cells that are pushing off of each other. They're sort of wiggling. Uh, there's there's uh, current traveling through it. Uh, they're they're not dividing like that. I don't at least I don't think they are, but they might be. But anyway, um, but I mean that there's a uh, the the plasma itself has a as a lifelike quality and it forms layers. It gives us the ability to map space a lot better in our local areas when we start seeing what we thought were clouds we're going oh look it looks like clouds and of course in you know in the 60s and 70s you saw a lot of uh battlestar galactica would show clouds as nebulas and such but that's when we start realizing right, no no, no. Yeah. The, when we got really high resolution these things were filled with little tiny filaments little tiny um electrical connections because that's what plasma does it, it forms filaments to make to try to get from point a to point b uh, and that's the easiest way it can do things uh, it responds by constricting or opening magnetic fields and so forth it's all yeah, uh, it's, it, it, electrically it would just all be bouncing around out there trying to find a neutral point right it, or balance it, yeah that's yeah. all it's seeking is is balance it's i balance. have no idea what the generator is uh just like we have no idea what the "Quote unquote Big Bang was right, but so they're both equally speculative there. But I don't purport to say that there is such a thing as a Big Bang. I have no idea. All I can say is this structure that we have around us is really, really old, and the certainties that we've earned with regards to geology, with regards to astrophysics, are uh, just plainly poppycock. There's they're they're a comforting story to hide the fact that our entire past is loaded with the worst catastrophes we've ever seen the word disaster itself means bad star okay these things came from the heavens and they scared <laughs> the star, huh? out of us. <laughs> yeah they, we were star. scared of the, anything in the heavens like i mean the sky is falling right. little i mean this, we're scared of that stuff and uh, it, it, we've basically been lulled into a sense that, oh, nothing bad like that ever happens now, but we've seen it, uh, with, uh, with, uh, that con that, that asteroid that came in there, uh, and blew up over Russia in 2013. Um, in, well, now you know why it blew up. It had to increase its surface area as it got into higher and higher levels of electric charge. Yeah, it electrically then, disassembled itself r at light speed is basically what it did, right? Well, <laughs> when you want to it, think about it, like it that. wasn't it wasn't a perfectly round sphere, but basically what would happen is is that it would have a coma around it, and the coma is all the electrons in the atmosphere rushing towards it, just like it does on the space shuttle. 
and this thing's coming in. It's not a heat thing. It's a coma from the the electrical potential difference between these bodies. Now, as this, it, it's not perfect. What will happen is eventually the core, which is is responding to the coma on the outside. So, let's imagine that the say coma is, uh, for lack of a better term, this this body is positive. Uh, that means its core is negative, and that means the electrons are attracted to the outside because that's how that works. So you have this positive thing coming in. Well, eventually, it's going to short. Something's going to touch. And the amount of charge building up in the center of the core and the surface, that capacitor is held together by the rock itself. And once it discharges, it finds a pathway to that surface. No. And it will yeah. explode in a ball of fire, as it did, well, short making circuit would be smaller infinite. and smaller pieces until it finally uh, was no longer arcing. A short would be infinite current for as long as the conductor could handle it, right? Kind of thing. So that's yeah. that's yeah, that's infinite at the, at that at that exact moment in time, right? So the amount of energy being exchanged there would be massive. Oh. God, yes. Well, you only you can do the calculation when you think about it yourself. Uh, it, the, the amount of energy, the amount of joules is uh, related to, I think it's, uh, it has to do, basically it's the voltage and the Coulomb's um, div squared divided by two voltage or something like that. Anyway, so you just imagine the volts then. A square of the volts is uh, 500,000 uh, volts. Just That's just the ionosphere to the ground or so. So put that in there, and then you square it. And then you divide it by 1 million. But the square of that is going to be huge. You know, At the end of the day, I think you're going to have a number that's going to be, uh, well, more than enough to explain why there was explosion that broke windows five miles away. So. Well, and so why it, they thought it wasn't that big, which it also explains why it's very scary when larger things are coming to the Earth, because what they think they have for weight, because that's their thing. They say, well, it only looked like it weighed about 10 tons, but when we did the calculation of the explosion, it was actually 10,000 tons. No, it's just that's how much charge it was giving off. The explosion of Mount St. Helens or the explosion of a volcano, when you hear them, you can hear the crack. It doesn't sound like popping. You know, there's no pushing or physical motion. It sounds like a short. And then, and then all this fine material is ejected and it goes and it's gone. And then lightning bolts shoot everywhere. Well, was, yeah, you definitely see that a lot around volcanoes is lightning uh, in, well, the, in the dust they're clouds. Because electrical, and it, yeah. I think. They're not. A, they're not have to do with some sort of sinking, melting stuff in the mantle, uh, whatever they're proposing there. Well, I think anytime, uh, you, well, kind of what you guys sort of get uh, do too, is, is anytime you have any mass exchanges of energy, why wouldn't you think that the, that, that would cross boundaries? and or You know what I mean? Like that makes sense to me. That, cause well, you see we know they happen and, on Earth anyway. We call them telluric currents. Yeah. Like there's there's electric currents that happen every day as as the sun rises and ionizes things. Yeah. Currents go into the Earth and try to travel across the planet to the night side because yeah. that's a different polarity now. And they do this every friggin' night. And so much so that we used to have to deal with that as human beings. Like uh, – just even in the 1800s, even right up until 19, when my grandmother died, it would have been 1997, I think, or something, maybe 2003. I'm not sure exactly when. Well, when that happened then, she would still at that point have been one of the few people that had bifurcated sleeps patterns. She grew up without an alarm clock. And every night she went to sleep, every night the house woke up at around 2 or 3 in the morning, maybe 1 or 2, depending. And then they would have a little biscuit, a little tea, play a game of cards or something, and go back to bed. Yeah, a very and, common thing. I yes, found very out. common. Yeah, really. I didn't know that. But yeah, it was a very common thing. Yeah. 
and that's what human beings did and it's quite there's arguments like for example there's that uh, place uh, in northern india i think called katahutik uh a h u y something other room anyway i can't exactly remember but they didn't find any beds and they didn't find any place to sleep and they began to think that these people didn't sleep and uh if you go into some of the works uh, by people like Julian Jaynes, he described the past people, the way that they thought, was not unlike a schizophrenic. They were hearing voices all the time from the gods because the gods really scared the crap out of them. Yeah. And because they were on fire in the sky and occasionally blew things up, right? Yeah. So – uh, and as such, they, you know, tried to do omens and divination and all this stuff. But this was before we were us, before we could have a metaphor, before we could, you know, basically have self-consciousness. But they were conscious, but not self-conscious. And that's why they were very literal. And in such that some schizophrenics don't sleep, which simply just don't. And as, if they had us, if, if it was the electric universe type of model where the planets were on different paths and we were uh say uh had a giant star to our north pole that was constantly glowing green or yellow green uh as it says then uh there'd be 24 hour sunlight to the northern hemisphere uh and why would they sleep why would they have a need to do it well we... if they, if it was biologically not required for them and they had a lot more energy too I was going to say, because uh, not sleeping leads to schizophrenia, <laughs> and being schizophrenic see, leads to not sleeping, right? I mean, it was cart horse kind of thing there, but... Well, we need sleep to... Uh, I, argument is we need sleep to, to communicate to the two halves of our brain to let them know what's going on so they can process themselves. That's what dreams are, sort of like that letting each other know what's right, going on. Right, uh, Because there's a little brain in your... A little, another little brain in your head. Um, and some people call it the unconscious. Uh, the Buddhists have this idea of going, you must find what your deepest wants are in your unconscious and then identify them and they will not control you. And I was like, oh, okay, that's very wonderful. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, that sort of thing. You're challenging those things, but come in harmony with yourself. Yeah. Um, that was the idea. But wh why would you need harmony if you, there wasn't at least more than one of you? And uh, so the his proposal, Julian Jaynes, and, and one of the reasons we like it is because um, in the Electric Universe, uh, it's well received is because it happened to have point out the date of 2700 BC as after that date, everyone started thinking like us, like Confucius and Lao Tzu and Siddhartha and Plato were all starting to think like us. And they started having philosophy sessions everywhere and they were introspective and such. But those were the last events that occurred, according to Velikovsky, was around 700 BC, 685 or so. After that, they were the, the la that was the last flare of Venus. After that, oh, there was I see the what sun, you're saying. So the, the and there was us, and that's moon, it. Yeah, and that's it. Everything got real, got real predictable, real. Yeah, um, we could stable, yeah, exactly. so, so stable. to speak. Yeah. And that was the last of our – there was no more Mercury, no messengers of the gods, uh, no zodiac light, uh, you know, no rings. Yeah, it's been uh, really no quiet ever since thing, then, hasn't no it? No <laughs> tree reaching up to the heavens yeah. as the magnetic pole. Because back then, if you, have a, if you were connected to another planet, it would be polar, uh, and it would be a connection that would be like a tree. It would look like um, – it would either look like a pyramid with a star on the top of it. Or maybe a Christmas tree with a wrapping around it and little plasmoids going up to heaven. Um, or it would look like, uh, in some cases, it would it morphed into a situation where it looked like it had roots that were reaching to heaven. Right. And it had a big bushy bottom part to it that was stuck in the ground. And that's the that's the cloud bank that, that was surmised to be there. Of it would have reached to space. 
and it was from all the water and dirt that was being vaporized from northern Canada, Siberia, and that area. The Arctic Ocean was basically being vaporized and drawn northwards to the, into into space, and um, so that's where that motif likely comes from. The star on the pyramid, the uh, the Christmas tree, yeah, with the angel uh, on top, kind of yeah, which is interesting because Santa and Satan. We all laughed at that joke, but Saturn. And huh. Satan was pointed out, and Saturn is therefore Santa, which is cool, uh, <laughs> which is neat uh, yeah. because it's the it's the old god, uh, Father Christmas. But the thing was is that this was in the pagan world this this was the god that was above the North Pole, and we still worship it today, okay, as Christmas trees, okay. I know it has a biblical connotation with all the Jesus stuff, but ignore that. Oh, no, it's got pagan just, connotations, too. The pagan connotation, yeah. straight up, yeah. was talking, and I mean, the Roman the Roman religion was Saturnalia for a reason. Yeah. Okay, Saturn was the original god. And the organizational religion thing that's happening here, uh, that, that people basically forgot that these gods were gods. By the time Homer was writing this stuff down, um, the gods were personified. There was no, within a few hundred years, we couldn't envision them as giant sky beings that were, you know, capricious balls of flaming death that could cast stuff on. It, it was right. impossible. We gave him the motif. A Zeus game became Captain God with the big beard, you know, the, you know, and the, and the, the laurels and whatever, and the togas. You know, and that's how it started rolling. And these people became people. And so the stories of the Iliad um, is telling from that point of view, where these people heard messages of the gods and they acted on them. Right. Uh, but Odysseus was thinking like us. He was he was totally cognizant. Uh, he was like, I need to con- I need to defeat. I need to get back home to bang my wife. So. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to sacrifice done. every one of you guys yeah. on the way, but I, but don't worry, I have a plan to do it. Yeah. And then he goes, first, six of you are going to die here. What do you mean? <laughs> We're going to fight this Cyclops. How are we going to do that? Well, I have an idea. And this is how we think. Yeah. And that was what it was. But that's not how you do in the Iliad to, to, to win the war, to, to determine whether or not to go to, uh, to go to war, Agamemnon asked Hera what he had to do. He said, if you want the winds to go to war to favor you, kill your daughter. So he killed his daughter and then he went to war. That's the stupidest thing I have ever heard. <laughs> right. Okay. It's weird. That's what they were like. They weren't us at yeah. all. Yeah. And, um, Oh, they so, ate each other. They ate their offspring. They, uh, they, yeah. Oh, changed, fornicated with everything. Yeah, changed you know, their like, gender constantly. <laughs> they, yeah, they were, uh, uh, not constantly, but you know what I mean? Like, they did weird things, for sure. Strange. Mo- only certain people started getting morality, getting, like, there were certain, like, the laws were happening, like the, you know, Moses, Ten Commandments, other laws. But uh, the idea of having a code of ethics and morality were not really... You know, philosophically speaking, just didn't happen yet. And we weren't, they were almost not capable of doing it, which is very interesting. So it's when you see those connections between that type of book, which is totally on psychology, and then see the connection between the Velikovsky and ideas that the plants were on different courses, and you see the merger between the two as patently obvious, um, then it could explain a great many things yeah. about our nature. And basically, it's a situation where our right brain became dominant. Now, we might have been different long before then, even like, I mean, when we when the pyramids long before, like when the pyramids were built or before things got um, disastrous, let's say there could have been a time when things were quite good. And it seems that we had civilization for a long period of time because of um, some of the way that we our teeth were. We find some people with teeth like ours. And our teeth belie uh, people who eat bread and cooked meat, yeah. not people who chew on nuts and um, uh, and don't cook anything. 
like right that those are a whole different teeth set <laughs> so uh, they they found pe- skulls that were not like that they were much more like like in, even in ancient egypt people had skulls like us you can see that their teeth were kind of like ours because they 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 didn't need the strong muscles to break everything that they got their hands on right uh you know with their mouth you know <laughs> like that's what they used it like, us we can go were- well i'm going to you know, I can I can drink things through a straw if I want. You know, and we have it made. Uh, what do you call it? evolutionarily now, man? It's so easy. It's too easy. That's kind of the problem. <laughs> that well, that is but a that's problem. Necessity, the mother yeah. invention. It's necess- yeah. necessity is kind of for evolution too. So you see the. the yeah, but, um, but the problem I mean, is, is we've we've removed all of the chlorine from the gene pool. And I don't know that that's necessarily a good thing, right? Like it still needs to be in there somewhere to kind of weed out the weaker. <laughs> Does that make sense? Oh, yes, definitely. <laughs> uh, there's a, um, I often consider this, I mean, Idiocracy took it up, uh, which was a perfect one. Um, they showed two families. One was a couple trying to have kids, didn't know when they were going to have it. Both of them had like 180 IQ eventually oh um, idiocracy i know exactly yeah, which movie yeah. the beginning well, I think, of it. i think he he eventually she tried to go uh, become a sperm donor and he died while masturbating right. <laughs> or something uh in a vigorous masturbation accident or something and the other one uh the other one was a stupid idiot uh, and had like who, 14 uh, who kids ended up busting yeah. his testicle and still ended up having 14 kids. Yeah. And, and so you just, the idiots just spawned <laughs> and the smart people died off. Uh, <laughs> however, necessity and the mother invention being what they are. And we can see that, uh, that, uh, they really took a lot more effort in their mental acumen in yeah. the past because that's what they had. Like we, we go look well, at they my definitely computer. Valued being so well read. Yeah. It was different. Well, even back, even into the 80s, this was normal. I mean, Captain John Luke Picard would be the perfect example of that, where he goes, no, personal betterment is what you do here. Yeah. That's what it's all about. Uh, money has no meaning. Uh, temporal power, uh, why would I need it? You know, I, I can make anything I want and I can travel anywhere I need. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I have, everything's defended. I can make food on the fly. Um, yeah. So, so what do you fight over? What do you fight over exactly? Yeah. Uh, you know, I have to get so you back. That on. was, there, but but the but his his philosophy though is his self improvement, and and it's stated several times, which is um, something that uh, I I took it to heart even before that show probably came out because I uh, I found that uh, um, I was rewarded. Uh, for knowing things or learning things, you know, um, inner space so, instead of outer space kind of uh, idea, right? Like, well, yeah, of course, it turns you a little bit of a, a book nerd, but th- th- you know, it also allowed me to cure a lot of things faster than than harboring them. For example, I was uh, got pretty uh, terrified by the movie Aliens, for example. So, um, and this is about eighty six, eighty seven or so, and the internet's the computers are a thing, but internet's not. And, uh, so I asked for all of these books on filmmaking and I learned everything about how that was done Yeah, and nothing scared me anymore. Sure. And I realized yep, that sure. knowledge is a cure for a lot of things because your ignorance generates your fear. And this of course leads to the philo- philosophical Buddhism yeah. that I, I kind of, took up and i don't mean a religious time i just mean in the general sense of um, the word yeah yeah like some people say oh no harsh rule you can not, never be violent well what happens if uh, rabid dogs attacking your wife yeah <laughs> punch the dog in the head like i don't mean to be rude but this is this is there's a right action there's a there's a, a action that is considered of all things yeah. and even if you have to do violence only do it for the absolute right reasons right. and ones that are absolutely morally justified. Right. And you have no issue whatsoever. There's, I mean, it's not really a hard thing. It's that the exceptions are really exceptional. And, uh, you know, like I'm not uh, going to save every bug. It's like, don't, you know, I, I don't really care about the reincarnation thing. I don't really know about this. I'm obviously not going to be, uh, 
you know, going and blowing away small animals in my backyard either. So, uh, you know, uh, you have to, um, when you take things into right thought and right speech and right community and right action, they're more like, um, being basically just being considerate. And as such, um, that's why things like, um, you know, for example, political correctness is like totally a wrong term and divisive in a way, because really when you get right down to it, the right term is being considerate. That's it. Like, I know. Well, you would think so. <laughs> but it, it truly is yeah, because it's I, only, I, I, it's only exceptional to people on television in the real world yeah. or on the internet, but people in the real world, right. If I go up to somebody and I use the wrong pronoun, okay, and I and I work with people who are trans, and it's no big deal. So, um, no one chastises me. They can clearly tell that I'm well over forty years old. Um, not really my thing to know all that. Yeah, you would think, but I'm not being yeah. rude. I'm yeah. going I, like I'll, I'll say something like it goes. How do you like to, you know, how's that work for you? Like, uh, well, just her is fine. Okay, cool. And I just roll with it. Yeah, because no, yeah, because the the intent is not to be offensive. Exactly. The, the, but ignorance sometimes <laughs> offends people. But that it doesn't mean that that person is trying to be offensive. But that's over offensive. Sure. Educate. Yeah. yeah. Oh like, no, I totally feel you, man. I mean, I, I get it. It's, it no, a lot no, of no, 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 no. Of course, intentional. I mean, there's intentional trolls who are trying to evoke that. Of course, absolutely. And that's that's and that's what it all gets boiled down to is the dipshits. It's the same shit, yeah. man. It's always it's the same. It's always the same shit. Same, the, the, the same reason the same why we can't shits. do all the cool stuff that we used to do when we were kids. Yep. Because if you need a helmet now because, because Timmy the, it's, it's a freaking idiot. <laughs> you know, like. <laughs> the dipshits. They, the, the, yeah. the same dumb douchebags that mess everything up all the time. And, but, uh, of course, there's always some really good things because we sometimes get stuck in our ways because we don't want to change. It's like, I don't care what you say. Seatbelts are a good thing. So are airbags. I'm very happy with those. Yeah, but <laughs> those, are, those are things you don't uh, – look, I, I lived in New Hampshire. It's the live free or die state, and uh, you didn't. there was no seatbelt law when I lived in New Hampshire at all. But yeah, you know what? For- 98% of the people wore a seatbelt in that state yeah. every day. Why? Because because the state didn't treat them like babies. It said, hey, look, here's the data. It's up to you. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone went, I think I'm going to wear my seatbelt. <laughs> you know? But, you know, we're not going to pull you over and, and, and you know, sit no, I, the I safety gotcha. police on you either. So that's that's what I mean. But, again, it's it's the dipshits. If you, if you program the world to... Uh, accommodate the dipshits that mean or to to make it safe for the dipshits you're going to make it really repressive for everybody else and and that's kind of what we run into constantly this is why the rural thing happened and people like i i come from a relatively rural area but i was sort of a suburbanite that that uh got a chance to uh that went that came directly from the rural so i could go there often and i was the kid from the city when i was there but you know i still had lots of cousins and i still you know played on the farm and and you know shoveled crap and milked cows and you know rode horses and you know drove tractors and uh yeah let's see if we can do make this thing do wheelies okay you know oh yeah uh, hold my beer is the yeah yeah (laughs) yeah. because it wasn't it was considered that you weren't that you had enough physic physical acumen to uh and, and that you were careful uh in uh like now today you don't throw things to other people back in the day throwing things to your friends would mean they would catch it right now you're gonna hit someone in the face because they haven't caught a ball in years oh my god <laughs> you know what i mean that's the right like, and, and me too i'm sitting in yeah. front of a computer and i'm going to go to work and sit in front of a computer yeah so i, I can't really argue right you know i know i get it <laughs> Yeah, but the, the, the world needs dipshits. I'm not saying it doesn't. We just need to stop trying to make it make the world dipshit proof. Okay, if they're gonna hurt themselves, you gotta kind of let them. That's that's okay. I mean, you should have that choice now to that, make stupid that's decisions. That's an issue called coddling, uh, and it is an issue here too. Where uh, I'm like, why are you, why are you being so uh, controlling? Right. Well, that's what it, that's children. what it turns into. Yeah, like, it's almost yep. like you give them shock collars and they can't leave the yard. Yeah. Like, I mean, I'm I'm not saying this to be weird, but 
you don't need to set up play dates. Just give them a bike and tell them to get the heck out of the house. Uh, you can't you do know, that anymore, man. Don't predator, go... predator scare. Ter- you know, it's it's. Uh, and it's yeah, statistically I safer today. Uh, no, I have today no kids, it... so I have no reason to say this. But yeah, uh, I, I, th- I mean, I look out for children, just like I would look out for yeah. anyone. Um, because it's the right thing to do. I don't have any, but I grew up around them and obviously well, everyone around one, right. I know has them. <laughs> no, I'm not scared of them or anything, but <laughs> you know, when, when you, but there's a right and a wrong way to, uh, cause some people are scared more than they need to be. And some of them are rightfully yeah. scared. Like, uh, for example, some, uh, we were talking about this in uh, work and I was like, What's going on with the, uh, uh, or, or, yeah, oh, no, we're scared about this and scared about that. And he goes, because he said, he goes, do you want me to, you wanted me to take you home or something, you know, and that was obviously a total stranger danger thing. But, uh, cause she was describing as a mother to this. And I go, there's a really easy way to approach a child that needs help. You pull over beside them, roll down the passenger side window and say, can I call your parents for you? It's real simple. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm not, getting, not creepy at all. Or can I call the police for you? Can I call? Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, don't get yeah, not not don't get in my car. My I got your dad on the phone. Or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a different. Um, yeah, well, then, but that's that. Well, and this is the thing. You have to be. You're totally. You know, I mean, I, I mean, we stop for accidents still here. Thank God, we stop for funerals here most of the time. So. But um, but there are uh, still a you know the the common decency ideas uh, and and trying to be respectful. Luckily, um, if you are remotely able to explain yourself or to talk, we don't usually take those to heart. It seems that those things only exist on television. And I'm I'm a little bit responsible for uh, sometimes uh, taking a hyperbolic stance to prove a point. But um, uh, Usually, when I think someone's being boneheaded or something, well, right? You well, know, wh- why do but, we why do we throw tamper tantrums to get attention? <laughs> right? There I mean, you go. So there it's you go. and it's whether you're a child or an adult, mm-hmm. it's it's all for the same reason. <laughs> or a president, even. <laughs> well, exactly, <laughs> a politician of any kind, but of any kind, really. Hey, man, I uh, I want to do. This was a wonderful uh, what talk, talk by yeah, the way. man, it was great. I want to get you back on. I think we're going to have Eric and Sherfu. Uh, but I got, I got some traveling that I'm doing here coming up, but I'm going to try to get this arranged where we can get all of us on the phone again. But thank, thank you so much for coming on and kind of doing oh, this, no this quick clarification uh, for me today, As buddy. you know, the electric view is, is up and, uh, doing its thing there. Uh, yeah. Make sure you get a plug in here for that. How do they find, well, how do people find you and, and everything? Well, you can actually just the electric view on YouTube yep. straight up. Yep. You can actually find this podcast will probably be on there soon. I always link yours to my interviews directory and stuff. Yay, thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. (laughs) And uh, there's, uh, of course, um, always uh, always things for me to do there. I'm constantly busy, as as much as you are. Uh, We're actually having, I think, uh, seeing the pattern on soon. We have Julian West coming out soon. And hopefully today we have a guy named uh, Sandro Garcia who who had this – uh, something very similar to the your viewers would probably like it involves the body being uh, a mirror of itself in many ways cool. uh, in organs brains and, or, and and locations and stuff but cellularly so and i was very interested in that and i hope i think people would like that but. yeah, cause yeah the, the electric views uh, you do a lot of very interesting topics uh there as well um i, I, I would call that a very eclectic blend (laughs) i guess of different people and different viewpoints yeah we have we have uh, we don't try to stray too far away from the actual the electric universe model yeah uh however as anyone can tell you it might seem like poppycock uh but uh there always seems to be quote unquote something to parts of astrology but then we start learning that there's planets have their own harmonics yeah uh, right you know that sort of thing you're like wait, wait, wait a second 
So these th- these chargers can affect us. What? Yeah. You so know, it gets you, and then it, it's got like tendrils. It, the the kind of the concept has tendrils. It and people into bring so- to it yeah. uh, their own uh, their own biases well, too, which is unfortunately one of the things that people have to sift through when they go looking for things on on this topic. Uh, uh, I entertain a wider uh, audience that, than most uh, than some, I guess. Yeah. But there are. But I also try to entertain all of the different electrical universe uh, theories, especially Velikovsky has his own yep. uh, different ideas. Like some people go, oh, it's this way. Some people go, oh, it's that way. And some people are always like, no, it's totally different. It's this way. And that links with all this wonderful stuff from the the uh, Egyptologist yep. crowd, John Anthony West and the Graham Hancocks. Yeah, the- it's fun, man. It's it, You're right. It's so – and I listen to those guys, uh, Robert Schock, and, now, and, and, I, and I'm hearing – a lot yes. of this same commonality between all of these different disciplines and stuff now, since you guys have kind of opened my eyes to at least hearing this this way. You know what I mean? Like, I, I can see it. I can see what you're talking about now, finally. And well, I'm and seeing that's, its he's trying to, uh, he's using, like, a lot of them use a uh, a model that's very, like, they walk the fine line. Yeah. For example, Robert Schock will talk about ancient destructions at the end of the younger dryas uh and he will propose a cometary strike um okay <laughs> that's way closer uh to the electric universe model than the other the other than the alternative exactly. right yeah it's, it's, be, please begin to explore catastrophism that's a good start you know, yeah, a guy, like a YouTube the, commenter said that too. C- catastrophism. It, yeah, well, it was it's saying. it's uh, what what became of Velikovsky's work. Carl Sagan, uh, it's uh, interesting, interesting that we bring these two up, Robert Schock and Velikovsky, because they were both done the same. And what I mean by that is that Carl Sagan in the seventies uh, attacked Velikovsky, and he thought that he was going to have an honest hearing of his. Uh, ideas and uh, it was a uh, an attack uh, public ridicule basically uh, unannounced roasting uh, and so he was mocked and Carl Sagan later apologized but you know yeah damage still. was done now yeah. um, the second thing happened is Robert Schock Robert Schock put out his uh, very obvious theory uh, hey, is this weathered by water? Yeah. And then he takes his hand off and you see it's the sinks. And you're like, oh, crap. Simple as that. Yep. All you need to know. So water rain there. When's the last time water rained? Blah. Yep. There. His theory is complete. Yeah. Now, you go ahead and these people try to put forth this and they went and said, let's have a talk about this. The exact same friggin' thing. And they tried to roast him. Now, the difference is Robert Chalk. Um, well, he had, uh, well, he had the benefit, TV, of, he had the benefit of being John around. Anthony West, yeah. uh, uh, Graham Hancock and well, a whole lot of other people. And the who internet, go, no. the internet was a big, was a big help for him too. Just starting. Yeah. So that's what, that's, I think is, a, is and sort this is of the same thing here. The, this, the deal changer is the ability to have access to alternative viewpoints without filtration and without still with, admiring the scientific method. And those yep. who came before us. When I diss Einstein, I'm only dissing the general relativity part as perhaps maybe something that should be sort of seriously friggin' reviewed. But his other part that he won the Nobel Prize for, kudos on you. I didn't win a Nobel Prize. Right. I didn't figure that out. And that was good. It was a good one. Uh, uh, same thing. The Nobel Prize winners like Hans Alfian said, stop using my theory that plasma is – uh, superconductive. It isn't. We've tested in the lab. Please stop using my theories. They didn't stop using his theories. But he, <laughs> it's got to be he, maddening. Well, it's but he died obviously in 1996. But he he said, okay, now I'm going to have to just make stuff without you. And as such, he came, started coming up with um, the model of galaxies that the electric universe uses with regards to the homopolar motor effect, the spinning effect uh and how they are on currents all of that uh is is well the the currents were named after kristen Birkeland, but yeah. 
Hannes Alvey and put them together into this uh, into this cohesive model. And he got that published by NASA. Like he's not making this up. He's saying yeah. there are currents. These are how they work. This is how double layers work. This is what plasmoids do. And now they didn't like what he had to say, but the end result was is that there are still now people who would read that and other people who are coming to the same terms going, guys, you have to really look in here. You you might be – if we're <laughs> wrong, if you're wrong on this, like we'll never – I mean getting to – we're shooting – we're shooting space shuttles, which are pieces of metal wrapped in rock, more or less, brick. And we're shooting that through a 500,000 volt capacitor. And then we're surprised when it explodes, when it has a hole in the swing. And then we're shooting another one into, spa into space, and it has an ion trail in the frosty atmosphere, which is highly ionized. And lo and behold, she blows up. Another one, uh, you're, I mean, okay. We're, we got to be careful here, this. man. We're going to start another podcast. <laughs> yeah, oh my God. <laughs> you know yes, what I, mean? would, we? I think we can. That's what I'm saying. Like, <laughs> uh, I think we probably could, we could do two or three more if we wanted to here. But. Well, I'm always available. And, okay. uh, and if, uh, and if people, uh, can't get enough, then please feel free to drop on over and we'll make sure that, uh, that we put some, uh, visuals to things and, uh, there you go. And, have a have a good time. We always have some good guests that come on and do that kind of thing and talk sciencey stuff. So we'll try not to be over people's heads. But. <laughs> All right, Neil, th uh, Neil Thompson, everyone, check him out. Uh, check out the Electric Universe on YouTube when you get the chance. It's awesome stuff. Uh, check us out www.noshitcast.com, can o w s h i t c a s t dot com uh, for links to where you can consume this show and others like it through podcast media. Make sure you hit those like and subscribes and uh, leave us comments and stuff on YouTube or any. And you can find us on uh, Twitter. We're on Instagram. We're on Facebook. Uh, I love the feedback, folks, and uh, I'll be uh, I answer you, and Neil will too. Um, so I will. Uh, uh, thanks for listening, everyone, and uh, we'll catch y'all next time. Bye, sickle.